Welcome to this special edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. Joining us to discuss the continuous discussion on the impact of rap music and hip hop is Nissan Black, who originates from Seattle, Washington, and now lives in the Holy Land in Jerusalem. His story is an extraordinary one, one to rebellion, crime, drugs, finding God, and then finding his passion, building a family, and he has been a quite a sensation in this genre. Let me welcome Nisam to the show. Nisam, thank you for joining us from Jerusalem. Thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Talk about your journey in your native America to now your home, Israel. Uh, that was a big journey. Um, started out, you know, being exposed to regular street life growing up in the urban city. Um, I was exposed to drugs at a very, very young age. I was already smoking pot by the time I was nine. By the time I was 12, I was already dealing. I uh, started running with a street gang, uh, BGD, or better known as Gangsta Disciple Nation, uh, now these days, and uh, got myself in a lot of trouble. I was expelled from the school district and, you know, started off in the wrong path in that system. And uh, as time it went on, I sort of got myself around and involved with the right people who were at different faith centers. One faith center was the Young Gospel Mission that got me involved, at least in faith. And that's what really got me interested in faith and started starting to seek. And um, from then on, when I became an adult on my own and finding myself also back into the same type of environments and the same type of uh, trouble that I had seen when I was a kid, um, you know, I got myself into a kill or be killed situation with another rap artist. And after I was spared from that situation, I started to look upwards, started praying, started going deeper inside the text. And eventually that led me to Judaism, which uh, a few years later would lead me to moving to Jerusalem. Uh, you know, your parents, both your parents have a strong background in music, especially hip hop. In fact, they were on the cutting edge of the founding of this genre. What about your parents and your direction during the early years of your life? So, yes, you're right. Both my mother and my father were both a part of uh, hip hop groups, the Emerald Street Boys and the Emerald Street Girls, um, which uh, both of those groups together pioneered hip hop, actually, in Seattle um, in, the, in the early 80s. Um, so I was sort of like, to some degree, born into it. Um, and also with that, also too, obviously, they had their, their own dealings with, uh, with drugs and different things like that. Um, but to see the transformation, I actually lost my mother to an overdose um, when uh, she was 37. So I was 19 years old when I lost my mother. Uh, my father today has gone on to make a major change in his life now. He stands as a professor, doctor, theologian, and heads an addiction program. He also pastors a church. So um, transformation seems to run in the blood. You know, talk, talk about um, how you found, obviously, hip hop, the music that you embrace today, um, the rap music is, is, is in your DNA. But you know, we were talking to someone earlier who made it clear that the rap music, the hip hop music, is responsible for so many murders and so many rapes and so many people being in jail today. And it's just been a game changer in so many societies, especially in the urban and inner city centers where so many people want to emulate that kind of music to be those gangsters. And they use the worst of profane language. They degrade women, disrespect women. And a lot of a lot of young people embrace that as being as some kind of manhood and womanhood to the, where it's had very detrimental effects. You know, my answer to that is, you know, I think hip hop originally in its origin, you seen was a lot more about having fun. I remember talking to my father, you know, about this when he was younger. He said it wasn't about all the gangs and all the violence and different things like that when he was younger. It was more so about fun, you know, having parties. They would battle not only in rapping, but they would battle in dancing back in the day about, you know, bopping and different things like that. And it was much more so, uh, you know, an outlet, um, you know, for innocent fun. Um, and time progressed even a little bit, uh, you know, a few years later when, uh, you know, Like a Jungle Sometime came out. It was much more so talking about our issues that we were having in the black community uh, more than the violence. And then later on, as time went into the 80s and um, NWA and, you know, others came out, which much more um, gangster music has sort of started to shape the culture and it almost became a way where it, it came, it brought itself to a place where if you weren't doing that, you may have been alienated from rap culture. And I think you're absolutely right. It's been something that is definitely, in my opinion, you know, with everything going on in the world today, everybody wants to know what the biggest threat to the black community is. I think it's definitely been what we've been doing with hip hop and allowing ourselves to, you know, uh, 
uh, continue to to feed back into our communities, you know, violence and disrespect of women um, definitely uh, definitely has been a major problem. You you know you know that's interesting because of the you could have embraced that and continued that legacy, but yet you chose something different. And many record executives will corrupt these young men and women. They could not even get close to a record deal unless they embrace this kind of um, this 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 narrative of degrading, disrespect, the profane, but yet you chose a different way and one would have been led to believe that there's no way that you can produce wholesome lyrics, God of the lyrics, lyrics that uh, that accentuate and uplift values and virtues and be a million, uh, selling to millions of fans around the world. What was different about you and your trajectory? You know, I think the difference was just a, a change of uh, change of environment, which led to a changing of the mind. Honestly, um, I think very much so. If things had not gone uh, gone in a way towards the right, they would have definitely gone in a way towards the left and towards the negative uh, behavior that I was involved in. Um, my wife has a friend who was struggling also with the father of her children, and she asked my wife. She said, "Why is your husband?" want to be there for the kids and you know I'm having all these issues with my father and she had many children that happened to have been by the same father um, and she said to her you know um, you know I want to know why is my situation not the same what's different about your husband and this is obviously a good friend of mine somebody I grew up with and you know we, we, we knew each other and I think the biggest difference was was a matter of change of perception um, when you have uh, you know uh, what's going on on TV and entertainment, all these things are starting to raise the children, and that's what tells a person it's cool. But when you get around wholesome individuals and you're able to see something different and, and really tap into the inside of you that really doesn't want to be a part of that lifestyle, then you can change your perception on what's really cool and what's not cool. There's nothing greater than being able to raise a family and then the, uh, from the fruits of that family that you raised to be able to be around for your, for your grandchildren. When has it ever been cool not to be there for your grandchildren? So talk about your music and what is so special about it. I think the biggest thing about my music and what makes it more special um, is that I didn't deviate um, away from culture and the way that it goes sonically. For at one point I did, and I came back to realizing that, you know, the best way for me to be creative and the best way for me to actually have an impact, you know, on the community as a whole is for it to feel at home and to speak the language that everybody else is speaking, but to say something different. I've always said to myself and I've said to others that, you know, music today, you're listening to it for two to three minutes. That's a big responsibility to have somebody's ear and their attention and for them to basically give themselves over to you um, for two to three minutes. So it's a big responsibility to be able to say something that's going to bring joy, to uplift them, uh, to make them think, and to better that person. A uh, person has to realize it. You know, I've heard many different people who came from uh, a street background who sold drugs and they, they may regret that, but it's almost doing the same thing that if we're saying uh, hurtful things or that we're going to hurt somebody else and then by doing so actually cause the listener to go and do something that, uh, that, that may change their life or, or someone else's. It's a very, very big responsibility. And I said for myself, I wanted to be responsible with the attention that I had. Would you have had the same success if you'd remain in the United States versus moving up, rooting yourself to, to Israel? You know, I think it could have happened, could not have happened. You know, um, I don't control those things. Things were actually happening for me. When I decided to leave music altogether, right before, as my transformation was taking place, I decided to leave for a couple of years. And at the height of that, I was on a very big album um, at that time, on a compilation album, which led to my album uh, doing very well. I had a single that was on MTV that was in full rotation. I was headlining major concerts. And at the peak of all of that is when I actually left you know, to pursue spirituality. So I think had I stayed on that path, then, you know, it only would have went up from there. But um, I was willing to sacrifice it all to make sure that I was doing what was right to me. Talk about your spirituality journey. Uh, my spiritual journey, um, originally, actually, Islam is where I actually started. My grandfather, uh, my mother's father, was a Sunni Muslim. Um, unfortunately, he spent most of his life in prison. Um, he came home. 
uh, for about a year, I think it, he was out, that he stayed with us. And during that time, I would pray with him five times a day. That was my introduction to religion altogether. I went to him, uh, with, with him to a mosque, you know, on Fridays. And um, that was about the, the end of that. Shortly after, he ended up back in prison, unfortunately, where um, he would spend the rest of his life. And then um, around 13 is when I got involved with the different Christian centers, the groups, because they had a hip hop program. That was sort of the way they got me. And that was, was really great for me because it kept me out of the streets and I have really close relationships still with a lot of people that were there. Um, and then, like I said, after the, the, my running with music, one of the biggest things is, it's funny you mentioned that earlier, is that the, I was actually <laughs> um, uh, sought after by a record label um, that my positive music was, uh, was not good enough, you know, when I was still involved in, in the mm. Christian Center. And so one of the things they wanted was harder music. And slowly over time, I gave them that and it turned into straight gangster rap. And I got to a place where I was confused about who I was. Um, that led me into another altercation with another artist, which led me to soul searching on my own. And for the first time I was away, there was nobody there pushing me towards this way or that way. You know, I sort of grabbed the Bible and started going going to work and I dug deeper went into a lot of different Picrifa uh, books, went into the Church Fathers, and I started going very, very deep. And I actually grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, so I was actually interested to find out more about Judaism. So one thing led to the next, and uh, eventually I found my path on the, found my way on the path to a Jewish conversion. Nisam, tell us about the advice and wisdom that you would share with aspiring rap and hip hop artists today. You know, my biggest piece of, of, of wisdom and, and, and if I can really to give over some strength is that, you know, we definitely will have to be responsible for the things and for the turnout of the things that happen inside of our community. And, you know, as I said before, you have a big responsibility with two to three minutes, four minutes, however long a song is, to be able to pump life into something instead of death. And I think it's a very, very... Um, um, huge task, but it's definitely something we have to do. The record labels, and I know there's many people involved, um, uh, record execs and different people who may not culturally come from the same background, but they'll be able to go and sleep and have a peaceful night at the end of the night, uh, wherever they are, but then we have to go back to the turmoil that we're in and that we perpetuate by continuing to make music. So I want to say it's a big responsibility, and if we want better, we can do better. And finally, how do we change and turn around the devastating impact that rap and hip hop has had on the world? You know, um, I look at it as an individual um, situation. I always tell people like this, you know, I have an opportunity now who I was years ago talking about, you know, hurt my fellow brothers and, and, and speaking in negative ways. You know, I, a lot of music I can't listen to. I don't know if I had one word on the on the record that wasn't a swear word. I was cursing so much. Um, you're looking at me now. I haven't cursed in over 13 years on or off a song. So I'm looking at it and saying, <clears throat> seeing that responsibility that I had back then. And it made me turn around and say, listen, I got to go back where I was to be able to redo um, the situation. And so now it, it takes nothing for a person to, to change the, the, the music itself, but what has to happen, the task is to change ourselves from within. And I feel like if we're able to do that and to start helping uh, uh, people who, who necessarily, haven't necessarily thought of themselves of being out of these type of situations, helping us get there, it start, sort of starts there. We have to change our idols. We have to change the people that we're looking up to. Nissan Black, it has been our pleasure discussing this with you today. We wish you well in your beloved Jerusalem, and thank you for joining us, and we'll be back with much more. Thank you.